Hello and welcome back to Handheld Computing. Today we're taking a look at running Windows 10 on an Atom CPU, specifically the first generation of Atom CPU, which was released in 2008. It's a 32-bit chipset and it sparked the creation of lots of low-cost netbooks such as the E1000. There were also lots of smaller portables released to take advantage of this new low power chipset, such as the Villid N5, the UMID MBook, and this Sony's lifestyle PC, the catchily named VGN P11Z. This first generation of Atom CPUs didn't require active cooling, running at a maximum of 2 watts, and designed to be run under a sustained load of a little under 1 watt. This means there's no noisy fan, so these PCs are almost silent when running. With a clock speed of 1.33 MHz, they're not exactly fast, but the addition of hyperthreading means that they are faster than if it were a single core, although not quite as fast as if it was a dual core. Paired with up to 2 gig of RAM and the new GMA500 chipset for graphics, these were more than suitable to run XP or Vista, which was the original operating system for this Sony VAIO. This would also leave them suitable for the upcoming Windows 7. With Microsoft already discontinuing support for XP, Vista a long time ago, 7 and earlier this year Windows 8, anyone who owns a device from this era must be wondering if they're capable of running Windows 10. We already know Windows 11 doesn't support such old CPUs or modest system requirements. It needs 4GB of RAM, a 64-bit chipset and a number of other hardware specs that these simply won't meet. So what does Windows 10 actually need? Well, according to Microsoft, you need a single core 1 gigahertz CPU, and we've got a 1.3 and a half, thanks to hyperthreading. You need one gig of RAM for a 32-bit install. We've got two gigs of RAM, and we don't support the 64-bit install. For the 32-bit install, you need 16 gigs of hard disk space. I fitted mine with a 64 gig SSD. You need a DirectX 9 compatible video driver, and the GMA500 is quoted as supporting DirectX 10.1. And finally, you need an 800 by 600 display. We've got a huge 1600 by 768. Perfect, so we can tick all of those boxes, let's crack on and install Windows 10. Before we begin, a big shout out to Ruth Rock who actually donated this device to the channel. I can't thank you enough. Cheers Ruth. So I've fully installed Windows 10 and updated it. Sony no longer keeps the drivers on its website, but this device never supported Windows 10 in the first place. There are no graphics drivers for the GMA500 under Windows 10, so I've actually installed the Windows 7 driver in compatibility mode, as this is better than using the Microsoft generic driver. So let's take a look at how it runs. So let's boot it up and see how long it takes. see if it's ready to open a document. As you can see the little timer is still whirring. So there we have it, about 3 minutes 20 to get in and open a document. One of the things I will say about this particular model is its widescreen format means it's excellent for having more than one document open at a time, even if it does take a while to open said document. I've managed to get rid of the screen flicker on camera. Let's have a look at what it's like on the internet. So I know that Edge isn't the fastest browser out there, but I didn't want to install loads of extra paraphernalia. So let's launch it. So as you can see, it's still loading. I know this isn't the easiest of loading pages, so we're just gonna go to Google instead. So let's do a quick Google search and see how responsive it is. Oh, 
So that was pretty quick. We hop onto the wiki page. So not too bad for a bit of light browsing. But what's it like trying to play YouTube? Okay, so I think that's finally loaded. You certainly need to be patient in order to get onto YouTube. But what's it like if you try and play a video? So let's see how well this plays. While we're waiting for this video to play, I'd just like to say a big thanks to my 1.9 thousand subscribers. And here we go, so it's actually playing. It does look slightly glitchy. Who's this handsome chap? As you can see, a lot of frames are being dropped. And this is because we're just not coping. Let's reduce the resolution and see what it does. And we're still dropping frames, so let's pop it on the lower setting. So let's see what it's like in 144p. Fuzzy is the answer. And it still looks to me like we're dropping the odd frame. So I really don't think you're going to be wanting to watch YouTube using this. So what about local playback? Maybe that's better. So this is a full HD AVI file. Let's skip forward a bit. So once again, you can see we're dropping frames and you might be able to hear that we're also dropping audio periodically, as well as getting the odd artifact. I say the odd artifact, that's a lot of artifact. Part of the issue here is the GMA500 graphics chip. As I've already said, there are no drivers for Windows 10. In fact, the latest driver was for Windows 7. It's worth noting though, that the GMA500, even under Windows XP and Windows 7, with the correct drivers installed, was still quite glitchy. On paper, it's quite an amazing chipset for the time, but the drivers never did it justice. But that's a story for another day. If you are enjoying this video, a like and subscribe would be excellent. Now let's take a look at what's causing all the lag. So if we bring up the task manager, you can see the CPU is flat out, with about half of its processing power attempting to render this video. In addition, we're using 85% of the RAM and there's quite a lot of disk access going on. If we pop across here, select the SSD and you can see we're currently using a paging file. So this of course causes some lag for disk access, although we do appear to be managing to keep it below 100%. So it's the CPU and the RAM here that are at fault. We'll get rid of that and then we'll give it a minute and see what it settles down to. So as you can see, after a while, the CPU has settled down to somewhere between nine and about 20%, but we're still using 1.3 gig of our available two gig of RAM. What happens next is even just opening a document like so, causes the CPU to spike. So we can see straight away it's hitting those high 80s. And again, every time we do anything such as resize the document, we can see the CPU spikes again. Some of these issues, as I say, are caused by the GMA500, which isn't optimized for Windows 10. As you can see, looking at the SSD, we still have a paging file in place, and you can see periodically we get spikes in access. So what can we do to improve this? There's a few steps we can take. The first is to disable some startup app. So simply type in startup and click it and then uncheck anything you don't need. So we can get rid of that, for example, and that since Edge will update automatically when we use it. We're not using OneDrive. We certainly don't want Skype. We don't need a notification icon. So the other thing we could do is if we go to security and then virus threat protection, you can actually disable all the virus protection settings. This means Defender won't run in the background and so you'll have more resources left over. I only recommend doing this if you don't use the internet on your device. In the early days of Windows 10, it actually ran pretty smooth on here, with the exception of when it decided to run Defender in the background. However, over the years, as with most operating systems, it's become bloated and sluggish as it requires more system resources. So if you're a patient person who mainly does basic office tasks with little or no multimedia, internet, or multitasking requirements, then Windows 10 running on a two gigabyte 
Z520 Atom processor is absolutely great. But if you are that person, I would strongly suggest you simply go back to Windows 7 and take care when accessing the internet, or better yet, stay offline. There are lots of alternative operating systems out there, many of which are specifically designed to run on low spec machines or have cut down versions. And it would be a real shame for a device as fabulous as this to simply be consigned as e-waste. With that in mind, I'm looking for suggestions as to what I should pop on here. Is it worth trying Tiny10? Should I opt for Linux Mint? I'm open to your suggestions. Pop a comment below. We'll do a quick poll on the channel and see which operating system I should install on here. And then I'll do a review and we'll see how much better it is. At some point, I'm gonna put Vista back on here and do a factory restore so we can do an actual review of what it was like. I hope you've enjoyed the video today. As always, a like and a subscribe is greatly appreciated. My name's Hugh. This is Handheld Computing. Thanks for watching.